Almost, here we go. Evening everyone and welcome to another edition of Tuesday Night Live brought to you by Crowcast. Massive couple of days in the world of the Adelaide Football Club and here to talk all about it are the usual suspects. We have Donkey Magoo. How are you going, Donk? Good to be with you, fan. Good to be with you, boys, and good to be with you, listeners. <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> very statesmanlike. Uh, oh, donkey. Very statesmanlike. Thanks, Mr. Laws. Uh, we have Macca. How are you going, Mac? <laughs> I can't match that. I'm okay. Yeah, and Peter J. How you going, Peter? I'm good, mate. Donk, are you uh, you auditioning for, uh, for to be next prime minister in a couple of weeks' time? But why not? Everyone else is. Everyone else does, I guess. <laughs> I'll get a joke. Knock knock. Who's there? Peter. Go on. Peter who? Scott Morrison. <laughs> What? Get it? <laughs> what? Knock, knock. Who's there? Peter? Peter who? Scott Morrison. Like as in, I, I don't know sure if you paid attention last week, but Peter Dutton was going to take over as a uh... prime minister. And he was like the knock, knock. <laughs> I'll get out the crayons and, and send you guys some pictures. That's very average. It's <laughs> very average. <laughs> if that's going to be an indication of the quality of your uh, competition segment later on, we might just have to can it, I think. Mate, this is the people want my competition second, and it's going to be expanded tonight to cover all the ins and outs and all the big plays that happen throughout the year. Uh, people are going to really look forward to what's going on tonight. <laughs> hey, yeah, look, the, uh, the, go on, mate. Sorry, I, I'm just going to say, obviously, this is revenge because I told you they'd rather have a, a sex session on my letterbox. <laughs> 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 hey, look, there's tons to talk about tonight, so we shouldn't dilly-dally because uh, obviously the competition segment is the one that everyone's waiting for, so we should cover all this other peripheral stuff first before we get to the good stuff. So let's move on to some news, shall we? Oh, except I haven't loaded the news thing. So just go on with it, Pete. Just go on with the news. <laughs> I'll uh, pretend that I heard the music, mate, and I yeah. will just go on with it. Just go um, on with it. Yeah, look, as we all know, it's a pretty massive uh, couple of days uh, for news at the Adelaide Football Club, and I guess in chronological order was the press conference from Collective Minds, which was uh, a little bit unusual, um, but um, uh, it, it has uh, certainly got the uh, the drums beating and um, got the media very, very excited. One Melbourne journalist in particular um, is, uh, is really... Uh, Really flogging that horse, and um, <laughs> flogging. Uh, so yeah, yeah, that's right. So that was uh, that happened on Monday, and then of course uh, the list management stuff started today, and um, we had the delistings of um, Harry Deer, um, of um, Jackson Edwards, uh, and of course um, uh, young Ben Charman was the other one that went, and uh, we had Josh Franco. Uh, uh, and say that he's been. I'm not sure if he came out and said he was leaving, but it was certainly reported that he's leaving. And um, and then of course we've got the uh, the major news which broke tonight, which was uh, Mitch McGovern. And of course, Finn, as you well know, we we broke that uh, quite a few number of months ago that um, we had pretty reliable information that Mitch was going to be looking for a trade, and um, uh, that there was a lot of fallout from the from the camp. Um, and that uh, there was potentially other players on the list as well that would be affected. And, of course, we saw the departure of Kirtley Hampton a few weeks ago. So all in all, a fairly tumultuous time. And um, it, it's almost um, um, you're, not, you're not an Adelaide supporter unless you're sort of used to the fact that it's a, a tumultuous time at this time of the year. We just seem to we, we just seem to get it year in, year out. So which one do we cover first? Let's start with the delisting, shall we? Yep. That's the easy one. 
So, uh, uh, my personal opinion, I reckon uh, Harry D is a bit stiff to end up on the scrap heap. I thought he offered something and I wouldn't mind betting that he gets picked up as a uh, delisted free agent or whatever it is, re-rookied or whatever, whatever happens at Hawthorne or somewhere else because I think he's got a few tools and uh, if his body gets right, then uh, I reckon he's got something to offer someone. What do you guys reckon? Yeah, well, he was in the... AFLX All Australian squad, so um, you can't look past that. <laughs> no, look, I, I I think that he had to be delisted because um, the biggest problem that Harry faces is he hasn't really set the world on fire, and uh, the where he basically plays, there's, there's too much competition that has got ability and will be part of the future of the Adelaide Crows, which again makes it difficult for him, not just with the players that are already there, but with the ones that are coming up and. Uh, and then we'll probably be there sometime next year and definitely the year after. So there's really no way for Deer to go. So I think we're probably doing him a favour by delisting him. Yeah. Um, ben Jarman was probably not as surprising. Two years on the list, uh, didn't really make any big uh, progression, uh, probably lacked a bit of pace uh, to go along with his lack of height. So uh, I'm not too many surprises there, I wouldn't have thought. No. No, I have a funny feeling um, uh, it, uh, whether whether they know something, whether whether there's something already in train in terms of um, of uh, being able to snaffle uh, Lacocious in the draft and uh, that they're clearing some room for him in terms of uh, key position players that uh, could possibly be uh, be something that influenced it. But uh, I think even without Lacocious, I think... Um, um, uh, as we, um, uh, who says on the chat there, tr- 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 somebody mentioned uh, Jason McKay. Good to have you along, Jason. Was saying that uh, the big uh, Elliot Himmelberg and um, uh, and and the fog had probably gone past him anyway. Oh, we we'd already moved on from Deer on to Ben Jarman, Pete. But thanks. Oh for well, I had no say. On, I, had, I, I had no say on Big Harry. So oh, sorry. And, <laughs> what do you reckon about yeah, Ben? Uh, but, Ben Jarman, uh, not surprised at all. The one that I am a little bit surprised with is Jackson Edwards. Yeah. So a couple of times I saw him, I thought he showed a bit. I thought that he uh, he used the ball very, very well and um, pretty good vision, um, pretty good with ball in hand. I thought uh, I thought he was a little bit stiff, but probably of the three, I think probably Edwards was the only one a little bit stiff. I would agree with you on that, Pete. Yeah, only one year on the list for Jackson, so... A little bit surprising. Um, obviously, we've got uh, the younger Edwards in the wings coming through over the next year or two. So, and reportedly, um, you know, without being too harsh, the better of the two, or shows more promise, the more promise of the both. Um, but that makes five uh, five out so far with those three delistings, uh, plus Gibson and Hampton. Obviously, in the club saying today that. No further delistings will be uh, made until after trade week. That's pretty standard. That's what we we normally do. The the ones that are dead set going uh, and of very value, trade value, they occasionally we uh, uh, delist delist them before the trade period. But in general, we hang on to most of them, and that includes people of the calibre, uh, perhaps CEY could be absolutely might be regarding that possibly a trade maybe not a trade and you know and then you you got to work out what you're going to keep and see how, you, how you've gone in the trade so um i think it's just in our standard way of doing things mm. uh, the, the one that probably surprised me that wasn't mentioned in dispatches uh is patrick wilson hasn't really been shown any particular favor from the club he, he did get uh one game and um you know, probably struggled uh, uh, play, being played out of position, although he came, came good a little bit in the second half, but certainly hasn't been shown any real love by the club. Um, so I was mildly surprised that uh, they let go of Jackson ahead of um, Paddy Wilson. Well, uh, you know, um, one thing in Wilson's favour, he has played one game and uh, Edwards is not there at the moment, and although I still think he should have got another year, um, Wilson did did not set the world on fire. There's no doubt about that. But um, as you say, he was played uh, slightly out of position. So um, 
I don't know. He could well be gone once they go through the list anyhow. Possibly. Possibly. And Matty Signorello is probably the other one, although he has shown oh. better form uh, as the years progress. Uh, uh, not, there's not much about Signorello that really stands out to me. You have to say to yourself, can you see an AFL player in him? I can't. I, I don't know whether others can, but I just can't see an AFL player in him. I think a number of those um, players, probably a little bit stiff, <clears throat> just in terms of how the year panned out for them. I mean, we we look at the AFL side and we bemoan the amount of injuries um, that we had, but that, of course, has a, a knock-on and impact um, to the SNFL team who end up having to fight their way through a season with um, more top-up players and you would probably uh, think, and n- normally there would be you know a few experienced players around them, to try and help with their football. Um, so I think a difficult year for them. They, you know, were involved in quite a number of heavy losses and, um, um, you know, very, very little in the way of experience around them to uh, uh, to, to help um, develop their football, I wouldn't have thought, this year. Yeah, agree, Pete. It would have been tough going in the Sandville this year. The amount of top-ups we had running through there and so little experience. Um wouldn't have been an easy gig and certainly difficult to show your wares as a as a young up and coming player, I reckon. Donkey, you're quiet. What do you reckon? Uh, I don't get the watch these blokes play at NFL, so um it's really hard for me to comment on people I haven't seen. But I'll do it anyway. Um it's I think very um refreshing for someone in the media not to comment <laughs> on things they don't know anything about. No, nah, it's just uh uh, I, I think Jackson it was was probably a bit stiff, as you guys have said, only one year. So, you know, you're really going to have enough time to show what you got. I'm hoping we re-rookie him or do something like that, but I um, thought that was a bit strange. Um, I would have thought that Harry Deer would have had a little bit of trade currency or at least we could agree some deals with it. So I'm just a bit surprised, but if we don't think we're going to get anything from him, then so be it. And I guess then we need to move on to... Uh, the situation that we first reported exclusively, didn't we, Pete? Exclusively on the 5th of June? It wasn't exclusive. 5th of June, it wasn't over exclusive. a week before Mr McClure got his teeth into it. Um, uh, I'll let you take that one. Well, of course, uh, it was uh, it certainly wasn't news uh, to us when it came through today that uh, Mitch McGovern's requested a trade, and um, we believe... Certainly, last I heard, uh, Carlton uh, were uh, were high on the uh, the list of suitors. Probably uh, um, in terms of having the cap space to make a a fairly significant offer uh, to get him across, and um, and also the currency to uh, to trade him out of a contract. So, which uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, he'll need a bit. But um, gee, they're old um, old sparring partners now, Adelaide and and, and Carlton. They're almost uh, aligned teams, aren't they? They just uh, the amount of players it's them to go back and forth between the two sides. It's amazing. <clears throat> so that will set up a fairly uh, interesting trade period for us. I, I suspect that um, we will be uh, looking to trade up fairly high in the draft. And I think Mitch McGovern really does give us uh, some impetus to uh, to push up into the pointy end. And um, though I've got no doubt that they'll be looking for Lukosius and, um, uh, and depending on where everything else lands, they'll be... Uh, you're trying to pick up one or two more as well of those uh, those uh, much hyped South Australian kids. Yeah, so I guess it begs the question. I mean, first of all, uh, before we deal with the, the machinations of it, uh, I guess we've got to deal with the issue of why Mitch has chosen to leave one year after signing an extension. Well, yeah, absolutely. And uh, look, you know, when um, when we um, drop that little bomb back in June, um, it was made very clear to me um, that uh, he was very unhappy with the camp. Um, there was also um, some issues with his um, with some of his uh, injury treatment. Um, and and they, were, they, were, they, they really were the two main um, issues that were, uh, that were pointed out to me. Um, but certainly he was um, particularly upset about things that went on at the camp. Um, now, I know subsequently uh, McClure broke the story um, about the fact that, you know, it was it was to do with money. If I'm going to join the dots on that one, Fane, I, I'm going to say that if, you, if you're a player manager and you've got um, 
you know, your player's pretty disgruntled and is talking about having getting a trade at the end of the year. And if you start putting out feelers, it's probably not um, unusual that, um, you know, some numbers would start to be floated around. Um, and um, that's probably, you know, um, the winds that blew McClure's way um, you know, so, some, sometime afterwards. That's my guess. I don't know that for sure. But... Um, it was certainly made very clear to me that in the uh, the, the initial um, uh, aspect of his um, uh, dissatisfaction, excuse me, dissatisfaction with the club wasn't to do with the money um, that was um, that he signed on for last year. It was primarily as a result of his um, concerns with the camp um, and his um, concerns with um, some of his injury treatment. And let's let's be clear about this, and, and this isn't a big noting session, this is just to, to add some context around what you're saying, Pete. The And we said it at the time, and we can reiterate it here, the bloke that gave us the information about Mitch McGovern has been continually spot on with every piece of information that he's given us. He gave us McGovern's re-signing last year, he gave us Jared Lyons, a number of other things. And it's from that same pers- purpose, uh, sorry, person, that we have uh, the information around, you know, the dissatisfaction with the camp and, and and all the rest of it. So we're not, I mean, we're not speculating. That's basically what's been what's been told to us. And I, I agree with you. I think the money talk, which has come up later in the season, is more of a negotiation tool. I would have thought. Um, I don't think it's the primary reason. I, my understanding is that from somewhere that I can't. Uh, remember where but my understanding was that Bryce is actually getting paid more than uh, sorry less than uh, Mitch so the issues around Mitch kicking up about Bryce getting signed on and you know money and all the rest of it doesn't really ring true and if I remember rightly uh, a couple of players at the club including the captain took a bit of a cut to keep uh, Mitch on board and to bring Bryce across if I'm not mistaken yeah, that, well, actually, that uh, uh, that was true. It was stated that uh, Tex took a uh, salary cut. Yeah, wasn't that the trigger of all the Sloan conversation? No, like, um, Tex took a pay cut and renegotiated for the rest of it, the, the extension contract of the contract, but Sloan didn't, and that's where we got to where we were with him. Yeah, I'm not quite sure, but I mean, the bottom line is, I, I, I'm with you, Pete. I don't think it's money. I think that's secondary, and obviously, the talk's going to be about money now because they're talking about contracts. So. Um, but uh, no. certainly the info that we got given in June um, was that it was camp related. And I and I can I can go back to um, the when we got the information shortly uh, before he well a little bit of time before he signed where he was humming and harring about whether he was going to resign. the The word that we got there was that um, he was relatively happy in Adelaide and and settled and. Um, um, that wasn't the issue around his re-signing. There were some personal issues, um, which I certainly won't go into, um, back in Western Australia um, mm. that were playing um, on his mind and that, um, uh, that, that that was influencing him, but he, he got past those. Now, it um, it then transpires that obviously in that, that camp that there was a... Uh, um, uh, you know, um, part of the camp that had them exposing you know, issues, um, and um, I think that, um, as I understand it, some of those issues that were personal to him were um, touched upon, and um, certainly created um, some angst. Uh, I think is the best way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, that's um, that's uh, as as much as we've got. And um, it's, uh, you know, it's certainly no surprise. And um, um, unfortunately, another high-quality um, young player uh, walks out on the club. Yeah. Well, let's, let's before we talk about possible ins and outs, let's segue from that conversation to the presser that occurred on well, yesterday um, by our friends at Collective Minds because that obviously, according oh, yeah. to our information, was a was a... Uh, an instigator for the McGovern situation. Um, what? What? F- this is my own personal opinion, um, based on the research that I did earlier in the season, um, and my own ability to read people. Uh, 
have you ever seen a bigger load of bullshit than the than the bullshit that was trotted out on Monday afternoon? It was a it was a very piss poor effort by them, I thought. Um, and the fact is, I, I thought very strange that um, they that these were supposed to be the big uh, the big guns of uh, collective minds. There's no there's no collective sign up anywhere in the background. There's no they could have been just two blokes sitting at a bloody kitchen table having a chat. And um, from the, the crap that they came out with, they might as well have been. I, I thought it was a very poor effort by them, uh, quite frankly. It's difficult to understand the motivation behind coming out on a Monday after the end of the home and away season on an issue that essentially died um, mid-year. Um, you know, it didn't go gracefully, but it certainly died. If you're if you're the CEO um, or, or the the part owner of, of a company like Collective Minds, who's enjoyed some pretty negative press over the course of the first six months of the year, and have subsequently been lying extremely low, like not any activity on their Twitter account, nothing on their LinkedIn account, nothing on their corporate page, like there's been zero activity publicly from Collective Minds since. Uh, the mid-season presser, basically. Um, why would you come out at the end of the year and reignite uh, the conversation? And as you rightly point out, Macca, without any sort of branding around what they were doing, I mean, there were two blokes sitting at a, a table with a white tablecloth with prepared statements. Uh, Derek Letty looked almost uninterested. Uh, they had Lee McCluskey running the thing with with a with a uh, a Peter Credlin type style about her and directing traffic. It was a bizarre situation, and for mine, the only motivator for to get Eamon Wolf and Derek Letty to come and sit down and do a press conference like that is someone has said to them, "Look, it's about time for the sake of your company you came out and actually clear the air, knowing full well that it would reignite a conversation, and that might have actually been." advantageous to the person that might have uh, um, you know given them a nudge to come out and talk in the first place well you know um, PJ Crowley makes a couple of good points in the, there that firstly looking at these individuals um, who would who would give a, a big fat contract to people like this I mean uh, and I will, well, I can answer that bloody Burton would because he's an idiot um, and I hate the guy. I'm really, so he's got to go. But that's another story. Um, and the and the other point is that uh, um, uh, I say, once I say Bert, I lose track of everything else because I dislike him so much. But um, that they don't actually do their business any good by what they did because, as you said, why would you wait several months uh, for an issue that uh, has died, disappeared? And then they've come out and they've made uh, comments which are contradictory uh, in many areas to what's been uh, continually stated. And I think, one, you know, one of the ones, for example, uh, made the, the media making a big fuss about this bloody Richmond song and because um, Pikey said it was played. And I believe Pike. Pike's not a liar. I believe Pikey. And they said it was never, ever played. No, so, no, no. No, Macca. And I, I made a post on Big Footy today, and yep. you and because Collective Minds put out a subsequent statement uh, today on the back of some of the the media reaction, which was obviously inevitable um, from uh, from various media outlets. And you've got to actually read what they wrote, and you've got to read what they said. They said that the Richmond song was not played on loop on the bus, right? The exact words were, the Richmond theme song was not played on the bus during the trip. There was a comedian on the bus who sang a few bars of the song, but that was it. Now, you've got to, it's not about what was said, it's about what's not said. It may not have been played on the bus, but I can guarantee you, because I've been told, that it was played at a portion of the camp where blokes were blindfolded and members, I think these were largely members of the leadership group, uh, were blindfolded and led off to a different section of the camp to do uh, another you know, module or whatever. So there's no doubt 
that the Richmond song was played at the camp. It's just that people didn't ask the right question. Everyone's asking, was the Richmond song played on the bus? It may not have been played on the bus, and that's what Wolf's come out and said, but it was certainly played at the camp. And it has certainly been played at other times during Adelaide's pre-season as well. I've been told by the club themselves that it was played at times during training sessions on the speakers at uh, Amy Stadium or... Uh, Adelaide Oval wherever they were doing their training sessions so the Richmond Club song was used as a motivating tool during pre-season the fact that it wasn't used on the bus is immaterial it, it has been used yeah I couldn't believe that they're the fast that Car- was it Caroline Wilson um, or the, 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 who's that buffoon on Channel 7 um, Sam McClure Sam, Mc- Sam McClure my god almighty he talked about it as if it was the greatest scoop on earth and um, he, he's. I don't, I don't know where this that this nobody's risen from, but um, the point that uh, I was going to make before is you could almost think you, you could be excused. And PJ Crowley made this point for thinking that Croc Media uh, revived all this. Uh, well, that's to, what I was alluding to, mate. Yeah, you, you, <laughs> because they are the ones that have, that have jumped all over it and make, making all, all the noise about it. And you'd, you'd almost have to think that, wouldn't you? Well, someone has motivated Eamon Wolf and Derek Leedy to come out and do a presser when the thing is dead and buried. Now, to my way of thinking, Sam McClure, being a, a, a journalist uh, and good at spinning a yarn, has approached them and said, look, your brand's been tarnished, your reputation's been tarnished, no better time than now, now that the Adelaide Crows have finished their season, to come out and clear the air, knowing full well, and this is only speculation on our part, but it seems to make sense, knowing full well that Collective Minds coming out and doing a presser is just going to restart the whole thing. And, and Sam's had things lined up since then. He trotted up um, uh, Jeff Bond, who is an, uh, the ex-sports psychology um, head at the AIS, uh, who reiterated some of the comments he made mid-season. He's had other stories about Don Pike asking Collective Minds back into the club. Like, Sam has had three months to work on how he was going to bring how he was going to revive this story and I mm. think I think and again just speculation but I think it, it makes sense that someone like Sam would approach Eamon Wolf and say and say look here's an opportunity now at the end of the season to come out and clear your brand yeah maybe there's a whole factor of things in play there we probably had an agreement with them not to pub, uh, publicly comment during the season as part of the exiting but part of the contract. Also, um, you hit on a really important point, I think, earlier on about how amateur hour the whole setup was at that conference the other day. And I know um, it's just the aesthetics of it, but the way that the, way that the uh, conference rolled out was just really indicative of if that's the preparation that they're going to put into putting in a press conference that's aimed at saving their brand and the product they're putting out to the other people, and that's what they come up with. What the fuck did they do to our team? <laughs> yeah, it, it was it was second rate, and you know, quite coincidental that it was conducted in the same room that Croc Media and Channel Nine do a lot of their stuff at the G. Like, yeah, you know, there's there's a, a thousand there's a thousand conference rooms, and there's a thousand uh, TV studios around. Why was it held? At Crocs space at MC at the MCG. Makes you wonder. Yeah. Well, you do have to wonder. You really anyway, got to wonder. The the bottom line is the Crows haven't come out and and addressed any of that. It'll be interesting to see if they do. I don't think they will. Uh, the Crows have, uh, you know, were begrudging it even coming out mid mid year and addressing it. I think they just want the whole thing to blow over. Um, I reckon they'll let McClure go on his merry way. Caroline Wilson's had a few shots. Um, as well, but there's really not a great deal of new information um, come out. So I I don't I would be very surprised if the if the club comes out and says anything on it. Well, there really was nothing new. It was just they argue about the, about the Richmond song, and I thought to myself, I, I cannot believe that this is a, a prime time media uh, arguing about whether the Richmond song was played or not. So what if it was played? Yeah, and the, look, the, the, another little feather in Pikey's cap I can give him. Sorry to speak quick, Pete, but the little cap for Pikey's hat is that 
he didn't allow the weaseling out of the uh, Richmond song. You know, like Burton was happy to sort of say it wasn't happening and Croc Media kind of happy not to say it was happening. But Pikey was, when he had a chance to speak, he goes, yeah, it was played. And, you know, it wasn't that good. And I think um, uh, I just really hope that he gets more control over the operations of that club over this off-season. Otherwise, we ask. Well, of course, the other the other bit um, uh, to do with the Mitch situation is the fact that uh, Mitch reportedly may have been unhappy with uh, the injury management side of things at the Crows. And that kind of leads into another little bomb that got dropped by Rowie today and which we've talked about previously with regards to Kangatech. Pete, did you happen to catch that this afternoon? Didn't catch that, but I know um, from chatting to you through the week that you had a couple of uh, little tidbits for us this evening. Oh, only in regards to what I think we, we mentioned previously that um, the Crows have been on a bit of a uh, uh, a campaign of, of cutting a few staff down there to uh, to make way for a spend on upgrading the interface between uh, or that we use to interact with Kangatech uh, is probably not a very well-kept secret that our, our implementation of Kangatech down at the club wasn't uh, a great success um, and you only have to look at the situation with Sammy Gibson to see the difference between how North use Kanga and how we do so you, did you not you not want to uh, go that um, that bit of bit of info about um, employees and certain employees and am I have I lost you <laughs> or you just uh, you're just not going to go with that one tonight that's all right just don't go with it that's fine I, I, just, I, just, thought, you, I just thought you were yeah, no, Sorry well, look, I mean, no, no, it's okay. Look, I mean, yeah, at at this stage, at this stage, let's just say that there's been some cuts made at the club in order to, to make way for a spend on uh, improving the technology that we use to utilise Kangatech and that perhaps not everyone is happy with those cuts down uh, at the club from playing perspective. There's been some, I, I believe, there's been some cuts to some areas of the health and or the strength and conditioning section uh, at a lower level. Maybe maybe some massage staff or physio staff or you know uh, ancillary staff. Um, so two things come come from that. First of all, it it kind of under, underpins what we've been saying about the the the. Uh, the less than professional implementation of some pretty solid technology in Kanga Tech that's been proven in other sporting environments and also the, the club's steadfast uh, desire to stay under the luxury ca- uh, tax cap um, by you know having to having to make cuts in other areas in order in order to fund some improvements in uh, in that area yeah well that's what you we were talking about that before the show started you and as you said, you, the club is putting money before success. Mm. Uh, it's, look, it's so just it's Campo. A... Sorry, go on. I was going to say, so does that mean Campo's doing the mids, forwards and backs now? Yeah, well, we haven't even got to the assistance yet. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, look, it's fair, it's fair to say that, that Kangatech has been a disaster and not because of Kangatech, but because of the implementation. And like I said, you only have to look at Sam Gibson. He, he spent two years under that technology at North Melbourne, didn't experience uh, a soft tissue injury during his whole career at North Melbourne under the auspices of uh, or under the oversight of Steve Saunders. And um, he comes to Adelaide and uh, under the same technology, utilising the same technology, and, and he's out for a third of the season with hamstring issues. <laughs> And no, yes, Pete, um, uh, I'm not going to talk no, no, about no. that other All thing right, just, just now, just now, not just now. I'm just going to I'm going to move move it along because you mentioned the assistance. We really should have yep. a quick chat about that because yep. I think that that was a really important development when you have um, uh, a quality um, assistant coach like Josh Franco who's been um, um, applying his trade at a professional organisation like the Sydney Swans. He decides he wants to come home to Adelaide. He signs a three-year deal with the club, and um, that tells you that he's uh, you know, obviously he wants to move home. And then, not one year um, into that contract, he wants to he's off again. And uh, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm interested in uh, everybody's thoughts, but that to me is a uh, you know 
this uh, that, that that's not a good outcome for the club. Well, the word is he's supposed to be going to Gold Coast to be with his mate Jute, but um, again, we got to, uh, 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 my understanding is he's not going to be promoted any higher, so it's an, only an equivalent job. And I didn't think that that they could break their contracts like that. Uh, I think they can if they if they get offered a senior assistant job, Maka. I think that's yes, part it, of the deal. Ah, oh, well, if he's going to get offered a senior assistant job up there, I think that's yes, what it is. He, well, then in that case, then he, then he has he will be able to move. Um, if it was just for light for light, well, then he couldn't. Well, what what you know the, that begs the question. It begs the question: Is <clears throat> if after one year um, into a three year deal? Um, he's gone because there is a, um, a, a a promotion. Uh, that says to me that he, he there is he can't see any pathway for himself at Adelaide in a th- you know in that three year period. Why why isn't there some pathway for assistant coaches to get into a more senior role when we have um, you know two assistant coaches there who are tantamount to public servants? Um, on, a, on, a, on a permanent, you know, there on a permanent basis, you know, blocking up those positions. There is, n- you know, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think there is any other club in the AFL who has two assistant coaches who just sit there like effing public servants and, and, and have tenure in their position. There's no, there's, there's no worry about you know, the right seat on the right bus for those two because they've got permanent tickets. They just sit on the bus and they just drive as far as it goes. They never have to get off. The bell never rings for those two. It is it is ridiculous. And you've got a club like Hawthorne who have an outstanding, an outstanding assistant coach like Brett Ratton. And Jeff Kennett um, came out in the media and said, you know, he hasn't done anything wrong. We we value Brett Ratton highly. It's just simply Hawthorne policy that after a certain amount of time, you have to rotate. You have to get fresh ideas in. You have to get new people in. And so Brett Ratton is a victim of that and no malice, everybody, you know, it's fine. He just picks up a role somewhere else. Why is there not fresh blood coming into the Adelaide Football Club in the assistant coaching roles? And when we do, when we get someone that's highly regarded like Josh Franco, who's from, who's applied their trade at a professional club like Sydney, why is it that he can come and spend one year at the club and see no movement in his future? And so he ends up at the Gold Coast of all places. It's a bloody absolute disgrace. Well, it's a bad reflection on us. Um, to steal a line from Mac, I couldn't agree more, Peter. And the other thing, too, Drink. about Campo. <laughs> I thought you were going to call me a dickhead. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> um, uh, no, it's um, the other thing about Campo, too, and uh, and not everyone's like this, but I think what you're saying about the um, the assistant, uh, the um, public servant things is pretty uh, spot on. You know, for someone that. Uh, doesn't seem to have the ambition to want that top job ever. You know, probably probably was a, a prime candidate after uh, 2015. Um, probably could have put his hand up at a couple of other occasions. Um, does he still only coach part time? Like it, for me, I, I really like ambitious people because I know they're going to burn themselves out to show you everything they've got. And um, um, and if you've got a couple of people that are just plotters in really key roles, then you're not you're just not pushing that pushing that forward at all. Uh, Pete, I'm uh, 100% with you with regards to this. Uh, Josh Franco relocated his whole family to come to Adelaide. He signed on, signed on for three years. And yes, Stuart Jew and him have worked in a previous system and I'm sure that uh, Jew made a, a pretty good offer to him to come up uh, and be his, his right-hand man at Gold Coast. Uh, the two things come of that. First of all, Stuart Jew is willing to risk his own reputation as a coach by having Josh Franco as his senior assistant. I mean, that's a key appointment that a coach makes, and Stuart Jews trusted that position to Josh Franco. So that kind of says to me that Franco's got some ability as a senior coach, as a senior assistant. And secondly, why is Josh so willing to leave Adelaide after one year when he's obviously committed to the club over a longer term? He, he Clearly he came to the club thinking there were pathways for him. Why, after 12 months, has this all changed? It, it, it smacks of some underlying issues there. And then when you 
when you you know you dovetail that into the as you say the public service style tenures of a couple of our senior assistants it it makes you wonder what the process of appointments is down there for uh, assistant coaches and who appoints them well i don't think it's the coach that appoints them because camparelli has uh, has survived three coaching changes yeah, I, I agree with that. So, so it who can't do you think be the that? coach. Surely it's the uh, football manager. Well, he survived two football managers, Maka. Well, <laughs> he survives I, everybody. Is it, he, I, don't, he, I don't know what to say. <laughs> well, I know what to say. Only, I know what to say. He, he's not on contract. He's just a permanent. He's got a permanent position. Uh, oh, he's on the Neil Craig deal. <laughs> he must be. on the he, well. Well, he's not because his contract's up next year and we don't want to pay him out, which is why he's still there this year, ostensibly. But it, it runs deeper than that, Pete. And, uh, you know, we um, there's been a lot of talk on, on Big Footy and other forums about how members can, can agitate for change. If you actually go and have a look at the way the club is constituted, then you realise very quickly that there is no mechanism to, to agitate for change from the membership group. Um there are existing uh, commercial and personal relationships within the club. You've got relationships between board members. You've got relationships between board members and staff. Um, you know, at, you know, there are definite connections between different members of our football club at board level and between board and, and executive. Now, when you're asking the club to conduct a, a thorough impartial review and if you're asking the club to be uh, forthcoming and authentic with regards to its assessment of the performance of individuals, that's very hard to do when you've got personal and commercial relationships with those people. Yeah, uh, that, that's exactly true. You're talking about Rusciuto. I'm talking about a number of people. You've got there's a, there's a whole lot of them. You've got I mean, relationships right. between Hurley and Rashudo. You've got relationships between Hurley, Rashudo, and Camparelli. You've got relationships between Rashudo and Burton. I mean, there's re- the, the relationships amongst the people uh, uh, who are decision makers at the club. Uh, it, they're all intertwined. Inbred, I think, is the term. Well, I mean. <sighs> Inbred. It, it's what it is. Whatever no you want to call it, you can't you can't uh, deny that it makes it very difficult to have a impartial review or an impartial assessment or impartial performance management of certain individuals. Because if they were, if what? they were to come out and say, "Well, Brett Burton did a shit job this year, and we're going to sack him," what it, what what flow on effect is that going to have? You know, they're not going to throw know. a mate under the bus. They're not going to do it. I wish they would. Um, but the, no, the whole, the whole point is that's why it should be really, uh, it should be an external review because then you've got no loyalties, you've got no uh, associations or bias towards anybody. Um, and uh, if you pick the right people to do an external review, you'll get the right result. The other assistant coach that uh, I think has left is... Um... Is it Kaisler? Yes. Tate, Tate Kaisler? No, he's left as well. Um, we have, uh, you know, I mean, this comes on the back of losing Teague last year as well. Yep. Um, I just I, I just get the sense that we uh, we have these really, um, Teague was very highly rated, did, did a very, very good job um, with our, uh, I think that he was our forwards coach, coach last year. Yeah, yeah. well, he was appointed did by amazing, Walshie. Did a superb, yeah, exactly. And so we have these really, really um, up and coming, promising assistant coaches, uh, and they go, they they leave, and there is obviously um, a ceiling at uh, at West Lakes that you hit. And um, and Josh Franco, I would suggest, has seen the writing on the wall, wall very quickly. Um, and they're all, you know, these guys are snapped up by other clubs. You know, Teague's at Carlton, uh, which is where Mitch McGovern's likely to go to reunite with him. There's been some speculation that it's one of the key reasons that Mitch McGovern will choose Carlton is to get back with Teague. And so, you know, these are highly rated assistant coaches that just come into our system and then flow out again. 
Yeah, because because, because there is this sludge at the top that they can't get past. Well, and we're talking yeah. like you only have to look at the the, and this is only personal perspective again, um, and I, I've got to say that at, on the Crowcast we're a little bit between a rock and a hard place because in order for us to bring good content to our listeners, we have to maintain a good relationship with the club. And yet, for the same reason, we're kind of duty-bound to also hold the club to account and to be honest with our opinions. So it's not, as, it's not that we're walking a tightrope here, but by the same token, we're very measured about what we say about the club because the last thing we want to do is put ourselves in a situation where... Um, you know, the club cast us aside and that limits the type of um, content that we can provide. But that said, that said, you only have to look at the difference in the rhetoric from our CEO, Andrew Fagan, to understand the impact that the culture at the Adelaide Football Club has on individuals. Because when Andrew Fagan came in, he spoke very succinctly about building a best-in-class football department, right? Best in class. So you're talking about putting the right bums on the right seats and Macca, this has been a, a bugbear of yours in particular. But it's hard to take Andrew seriously when subsequently in more recent times when comparing uh, Brett Burton to, say, the outgoing uh, head of strength and conditioning, Nick Poulos, it's hard to take Andrew seriously when he says that Brett Burton runs rings around Nick Poulos. Nick Poulos just spent six months with our World Rugby Sevens system. Nick Poulos is a world-renowned uh, mouthpiece for injury management. He's widely respected. He has delivered at conferences. He, he is... In the space that he operates in, he is on a world stage. Now, Brett Burton has one failed appointment at, at Brisbane behind him, and now he's at Adelaide. So it's hard to take Andrew seriously when he says that Brett runs rings around Nick Poulos when the facts in front of you say exactly, like, just objective, without knowing either of the two individuals personally or, or professionally, the, the facts that sit in front of you say that that, that can't possibly be true. Well, so, they made the point that they searched everywhere and he was the best one to come up with. And we're comparing that position that he's holding with Neil Barn from Richmond. Come on. Yeah, well, on. That's, that, that's like having 10 million in one hand and, a, and three cents in the other. Also, um, for a bloke that's supposed to be our fitness expert guru, you know, all around top bloke, I, I'm looking at his um, footy wire here. He managed to put a full season together by the look of it on uh, one occasion, like an actual full season, and uh, he never actually managed to get himself fit himself. Like, I reckon 16, 17 is probably his average games per season. Like This is a bloke that couldn't get himself fit, and we're trusting him to get a whole club fit. Yeah. Uh, you know, that, that might be just his own body that dictates that. Um, or he was pushing himself so hard all the time and quite he kept possible. breaking it. Yeah, quite possible. But, but I, you are right, though. I guess about that... what Fagan said, though. He said he was going to have the, the best people in every position. and uh, Best in class in the football club. department. He We sat there and listened to him say it, Macca. Best in class yep. football department. And I guess the point that I'm making is is that the culture is very thick at the Adelaide Football Club. Very thick. And I very thick, yeah. I have observed a change in the demeanour and the rhetoric that's come from Andrew. And, you know, it, it's it's not the authentic club that was promised to us back at the start of 2015. And, you know, notwithstanding Phil's tragic passing, the club set themselves on a path, irrespective of who was coaching. You would have hoped that even if Phil... Uh, you know, carried out his tenure and left, that the club, the club would have continued along this path. They set themselves on a path of authenticity, of, of being a no-spin club and having best-in-class appointments. And yet here we are three years later, we've got a, a absolute disastrous uh, situation with Collective Minds. We've got a poorly 
implemented system in Kangatech. We've got the club that's spinning harder than my washing machine on spin cycle. <laughs> and it makes you wonder what happened to that authentic club, that no spin club. What happened to that? Yeah, it's a very good point. It's a very good point. I, I actually thought when Rue first came into the club that he would uh, be a no-nonsense man and wouldn't and would not tolerate that sort of stuff. And uh, it seems to me like he, unfortunately, his relationships with people encourage that sort of thing. Well, I, I think I, I feel like when Fagan came in and Rue came in, there was a proper clean. Like they felt like there was a cleaning out and a changing of the guard, especially after the you know, the triggy sort of years. And I actually felt a refresh. But what I think's happened is they got close, you know, they got pretty close to the flame at the end of last year. And now they're sort of working hard and holding on tight and, you know, clinging to the fact that they're only, you know, two and a half quarters away from a flag. And they're not actually sitting there going, actually, this is what we really are. Like, this is, these are the problems that we have right now. And if we don't conquer these problems, they're going to keep dragging us down further and further. And... Um, I, I, I truly believe Pikey sees where we are. I don't I worry about everybody else. Well, this is where I draw Pete back into the conversation because that would all be well and good, Donkey, except that it's not a club-wide realisation because we've heard whispers all season about fractures within the playing group, uh, between the leadership group and others, and we've also heard uh, whispers of disharmony between uh, certain sections of the playing group and the administration. So to me, it's not a unified club at the moment. Pete, would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. And I think that um, uh, it's, uh, I mean, we've certainly, you know, we've certainly had information through uh, about, um, you know, some of the, uh, the the various sort of cliques in, in, in the playing group. And um, But also, um, I think more importantly, we've had um, uh, certainly some, some uh, pretty solid, um, information in relation to a couple of players being dissatisfied. Mitch wasn't the only one mm. dissatisfied with his injury treatment. Um, so um, there is some uh, s- some more um, issues there in relation to. I mean, there are two other players that we know of for sure that have been in dispute with the club um, in relation to their injury treatment. Um, yep. There's and, a lot of noise about Brad Couch too, is unless he was one of the two. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and so um, that's um, yeah. No, well, he's the one I'm worried about. Like, I think, mean, like, like, yeah, yeah. Well, you wouldn't have to be, you wouldn't have to be a rocket scientist to work it out, would you, Donk? Nah. Um, nah. And um, and there was another one as well. So you know, um, there's no doubt that there has been um, there's been that, that there is friction down there. But what they need, they just need to to use this extra month that they're going to get. Um, uh, you know, to get a march on 2019, and to uh, and to resolve some of these issues and put them to bed. And it's very difficult when you're talking about a player that may have been relying on a certain number of games or a certain level of output in order to trigger some some clauses in his contract, who may feel mm. that his inability to pull those triggers or to trigger those clauses was not his fault, but the manner in which he was managed by. Uh, a dysfunctional health, a strength and conditioning department, Pete. Well, that's right. I mean, we know that there's one player in dispute down there um, uh, for that very issue, which I know that's why you braced it. Um, so, yeah, there is, you know, there is some, there, there, there is uh, some problems down there, and, and I, you know, um, you can't, cannot hide away from the fact that year upon year we have, you know, quality young players that walk out of the club. You know, there's got to be, there's got to be some accountability for that. We can't, we can't, you know, we can't just keep saying it year upon year that, oh, there was this reason, oh, there was that reason, oh, we were a bit unlucky with this and we were a bit unlucky with that. It's been going on. The exodus has been going on since 2012. Yeah. And it happens almost pretty much every year. Yeah. Yeah. And they're always the good ones, of course. Oh, Yeah. I mean, I mean, the joke's going to be is going to be the all the all Adelaide exit team, <laughs> <laughs> and that that won't be far away from being named. <laughs> and, and can you imagine what that Bloody team's going to look like? Bloody good it's going to be an out, it's going to be an outstanding team. <laughs> well, the, yeah, it'll be called Adelaide Exit Team All Stars. I wonder how mm. many, not posthumous, but po, po, you know, what is it, post all Australians there are in that team, 
Dangerfield, Gunson are a couple. Phil Davis, I think, has got one. There's a fair few yeah. All-Australians that occurred after after they left us. It's going to be a high-quality team. Uh, can I speak? Can I can we just uh, move quickly to a positive? Um, um, just as I'm, I'm having a look at the clock, and there was just yep. one really, really big positive that I I wanted to uh, to get out there tonight, and that was a big um, shout out for the uh, for big uh, Elliot Himmelberg and his debut on Saturday night. It was worth turning the. T- I wasn't even going to watch until I realised that he'd been named. And as you all know, he's a favourite of mine, and I've sort of talked him up a lot. Um, I think I might have put out a tweet that I think that. Um, in four or five years' time, if you want to redo the uh, 2016 draft, um, he'll be a top 10 pick. Wow. And that's that he'll, he'll move from 50 or 51 down into a top 10 pick in five years' time if you redo that draft in five years. That's how much I believe in him. And I, <laughs> I think it, he has got so much talent and um, he is nowhere near ready to play AFL football at this stage. And, um, and he proved that in the second half. But what... <laughs> What we saw in that first half um, should have delighted all Crows yeah. fans, and provided we can keep him, um, he is a uh, he is a two hundred centimeter, you know, huge body um, that has you know incredible agility uh, for his size, and he has an absolutely outstanding football brain. Um, his pick, his below the knees pick up and handball to Jordan Gallucci yeah, to set up a goal. That. that goal assist was absolute for a two hundred centimeter bloke. That was absolute pure class, um, and um, and of course the Hollywood goal um, spoke for itself. So a big shout out to him. I thought it was a, um, for for a kid that I don't believe will be ready for AFL football for another twelve months. Um, to get a little taster like that, I thought was terrific, and he just showed uh, what he will be capable of when, when his body is right and ready to go. Yep, can't argue that in any of that. Well, you drink. Just said in yeah. Um, I, I, I like the agility of the guy and also the way that he uh, he reads where the ball's going to. That's why a couple of times he smashed into Jenkins because his yeah, eyes were so, spot. Yeah, well, they were you know, totally on the ball. The other thing I really loved is just the way that um, – when he, you know, he, he's lead up in the first quarter, he's lead up a mark, just that really, really decisive um, decision making um, and quick brain mm. to get that ball into open space for Jenkins to run onto. Um, didn't, you know, doesn't doesn't look particularly spectacular, but that took really, really quick movement, quick thinking, and he got the ball right exactly where it needed to be for Jenkins to run onto. Um, he's just a really, really smart footballer and good pace for his size. Yeah. Yeah, very, very, um, so very good, Pete. That's a uh, tick. Uh, uh, yeah, it's a big tick, and you know that it was a nice way to round off the season. And we can talk for five seconds about the Carlton game, I guess. Um, uh, Macker and I have obviously had our say on the Carlton game uh, on Sunday night, but uh, really, that was really the only thing to to come about come out of it that was uh, uh, that and and Wayne Miller's ongoing progression as a footballer and also Jordan Gallucci's ongoing development as a footballer uh, were probably reason enough to watch was what was otherwise a, a, a non-event yeah it was an absolute nothing game and and as I said if uh, if the Big Easy hadn't have debuted um, uh, I wouldn't have even turned on the TV to be honest um, so it was uh, terrific to see him and as you say uh, Jordan Gallucci, who we've talked about as being such a promising uh, young player, um, and you know you just got to, you know, kids like I mean Miller is safe, but the kids like uh, you know Gallucci, Himmelberg, Dude, who, who've you know come on so wonderfully this year, you know you, you just got to hope you can keep them. Yeah, you know because that's where we are as a club. Yeah, well, uh, PJ I think said on the on the chat. Himmelberg's going to play 150 games, and I just hope that's 150 games with us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who <he> with? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, anything else that we can talk about? I mean, we're into match talk, but who wants to talk about the Carlton game really? Because it was a non-event. Um, just, just very quickly, um, I did have a little little bit of information come my way about yep. some early targets in the uh, in the trade period. A couple of players that we're look, potentially looking at. Um, no, nothing to say that we'll get these players across the line, but these are just a couple of players that uh, I'm, I'm hearing that we're looking at. Um, first one is a, uh, a kid by the name of um, James Rose, who is a midfielder currently 
with the Sydney Swans. Veen, you might remember him. He was picked 37 in the 2014 draft from the Sturt Football Club. God, um, I didn't even realise con- he was still in the, in the system. Yep. So he's still on – he's out of contract um, at the end of this year and uh, still on Sydney's list. He's only played – he's been on the list for four, for four years, just the 10 games uh, for him. So has uh, n- not found it easy to break into that uh, Sydney midfield. And um, so uh, he is on our radar. And the second player I'm hearing is on our radar is um, Adam Thomason, at uh, GW, key position player um, at uh, GWS. So there's just a couple of names to keep an eye on during the trade period. Mm. And is, is, is Thomas out a contract at the end of this year? Uh, good question, Mac. I didn't actually check. I didn't have time to check. I only uh, managed to look up uh, James Rose, so I'm not sure about Thomason. I assume he would be. They've been using him as a jack of all trades. He's been playing down back, up forward, on in ruck, all over the place. That's probably mm. the reason, Mac. We're probably one short in our back stocks in that area, and. Uh, I think the interesting thing is if we uh, if we end up looking at a, a ruck, our ruck situation, um, hard, hard to believe they're going to persist with Riley O'Brien, if you ask me. Yes, you don't, you don't hear much about him, but that's for sure. Well, he's been injured for the last couple of months, but by golly, he's been on the list for, what, three, four seasons now? Um, three, I think. But yeah, yeah four, I reckon he'd be on just about four years, I reckon. Thing. Yeah, so it'll be interesting to see uh, what they do there. Um, you, you try and tell Source he's having a rest. Oh, uh, well, you know, in some sense, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's probably a chat for another time once we understand what's going on with our, our trading. Uh, and just uh, before we finish up this segment and move into what everyone's waiting for, which is Donkey's Competitions. I uh, have to say good day to the people on Facebook. Uh, thanks for joining us and obviously our regulars and some new faces on the Spreaker chat as well, which has been streamed on our Facebook Live video. Uh, thanks all for your ongoing support as usual. Do we want to get into some competitions, Donkey? Are you prepared for your big moment? Yeah, look, I'm, I'm, I've been really looking forward to this moment all season. Hang I know that um, wait people for on the your cast. Music, wait for your music. Go. <laughs> <laughs> Where is Good he? Evening. Good evening, oh and welcome God. to. Dream Team and Sports Tipping Competition Finality for 2018. I just want to um, say a big thank you to everyone that participated in all the competitions that we've got going. Um, I know it's a bit boring to hear uh, rattling through some of these figures uh, on the cast, but um, uh, but a really big thank you for everybody involved in in jumping on and getting involved. Um, we've had a lot of fun um, sledging me in the background over this competition report every night. So uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I wouldn't feel like part of the team if it didn't happen. So happy days. Um, we're going to go through uh, the grand final over the weekend and all of the ins and outs for both with, both grand final teams over the whole year just to see how they put those sides together um, and different trading strategies that they used. And then we're going to go no, and no. Uh, jump across to the tipping. Oh, well, I wasn't, but I've been doing research throughout the cast. That's why I've been a bit quiet. Um, uh, also, also, uh, I wasn't on uh, on Sunday night, but apparently a few of you blokes um, sledged me. Um, I've been asking for names. They haven't been provided to me, but I will go back and find them. So, um, nah, look, let's get into it. So, we had a big grand final here in the Real Dream team over the weekend. Uh, it, was a, it was a cracker of a match. Um, both the Winter March and Dylan FFC scored more in one round than Phoenix did in his last three, I think. So, that's pretty exciting. That takes some doing, you know. <laughs> Not even kidding. Um, oh, actually, a little bit kidding. You're probably about 500 short, but, you know, they did pretty well. Uh, the Winter March, uh, or Peanut, as he's known on the Big Footy board, uh, came in with a big uh, 2,622, which is a huge score, really. Um, for would win uh, most comps, really. Would have, would have won most comps. It just shows the high calibre of um, our league, which was ranked 567 out of a whopping 
1,273. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Winter March had a few good wins throughout the year, so um, great stuff, Peanut. You've done really well. You've only gone down by a handful, but Dylan FCC uh, um, comes through on 2,668 and claims the claims the crown, bragging rights, and uh, and uh, and the signed footy. So, um, so Dylan as the uh, me as the super coach Div One champion of the Adelaide Crows board. I say congratulations to you as the dream team champion. So a couple of champions there, one round talking to each other. It's amazing we've got a live studio audience in tonight. Yeah, thanks for mum. Mum sitting over in the corner just listening to me. It's been really good. Hey, Fane, can you can you use that when we do the live calls next year? Yeah, that's right. Kick <laughs> uh, on. All right, no worries. We'll do. <laughs> Look, um, I'm going to start with probably my biggest disappointment of the uh, tipping competition. I was um, I was pretty heavy on. I thought Moyley was going to come through and take the crown. About eight to uh, eight weeks ago, I thought he was our man, but uh, he has. Um, He's put in the Port Adelaide and fallen right away. Uh, he's only come in at 135, so he's coming at fifth. Uh, Dom, 135 as well. Um, got the nod on uh, over with the cumulative margin and fourth. Uh, cellar dwellers have come in at 136. Uh, and then it's up to uh, B Short and J Mac to see who got the biscuits for the year. So, again, well done, guys. Hard tipping all year. And, uh, and uh, J Mac is the 2018... Crows cast tipping champion on one forty one. So well done, mate. J Mac. You have nailed it. <laughs> oh, that's enough. And as we move down to the uh, Crowcast end of the ladder, um, Donkey Magoo leading out from Pete by two points. Uh, who was leading out Fiend by six points. Again, mm. we all got six for the round. Uh, amazing. I think the last 12 weeks we've been in step and haven't missed a beat each with each other. And, uh, <laughs> I and, wonder uh, why it was. <laughs> lots, of a, lots of away team. <laughs> yeah, it was amazing. We've all got six this week, which was the amount of away teams at one. So it was fantastic effort from, from all three of us. Yeah, it was crazy stuff. So that is it. That's the wrap from the Sports Desk Procast oh, something on, something tonight. Hang, hang on a minute, Donkey. What do these blokes win? Pride. Oh, and footies. I've already mentioned the footies. Did you mention the footies, did you? Oh, yeah, you did. I yeah, nodded off. <laughs> <laughs> nice work. Nice work, Donk. Nice work. Oh, goodness me. Very good, Donkey. Well done, mate. Thank you. And uh, I guess now it's time for... Game of Crows. Well, Game of Crows, eh? It was a difficult uh, final round for everyone concerned, really, because we had... uh, a rather contrived situation in terms of how we wanted to finish off the season. Uh, but it was necessary because it was such a dog's breakfast throughout the year. So uh, thanks to everyone who uh, stuck with us. We didn't have too many entries in the final round, which is probably indicative of uh, how things played out. But nonetheless, uh, we did find a winner. And uh, if people will just bear with me for a moment, I'll bring that up onto the screen. But uh, who's that? Mackie, Sorry. you're out. That was Donkey. Was it Donkey, was it? <laughs> wouldn't be, man. I wouldn't do that. Uh, donkey. Yeah. <laughs> but look, without further ado, I'm pleased to announce that the winner of Game of Crows this year with a, to- a score of 106 points was Grey Crow from the Big Footy Boards. Um I've got the final round results here uh, that people can look at. And Grey Crow actually um, scored, what did he score? Minus 45 for the last round. Uh, Buckets NJ, who was leading for the majority of the season, crashed and burned because he failed on Sydney and the Giants 
uh, in that final round, so he got a fairly bad score. Um, Captain and Mads was another one who uh, just failed on the Sydney one, which cost a couple of people. And uh, Joel Constable, who I thought might have snuck in as a previous winner, he uh, failed on the Giants and Sydney. So uh, Grey Crow got eight out of eight. No one actually got any bonus scores at all, uh, but the eight out of the eight was enough for Grey Crow to win the carton of beer for 2018. So thanks everyone who participated in Game of Crows during the season. Uh, I don't think we did Scorpus justice in terms of how we ran it, but it will be back again, bigger and better, as will our tipping and dream team competitions next season. And for those of you who are familiar, we will probably be doing something around Moneyball next season. Moneyball is another... Uh, so, Donkey, you familiar with Moneyball? Uh, no, not at all. And we'll have to talk about this away from other people, I think. Yeah, I, I know. Yeah, so Moneyball is an opportunity to do head-to-head stuff and one-off stuff, and we'll be utilising that a little bit um, throughout the 2019 season. So we have to say a big thank you to the Adelaide Football Club for donating the footies uh, for the Tipping and Dream Team competitions. Thanks to Ian Shuttleworth and uh, the Crows for those signed footy, signed by Tex and also Pikey. Uh, if uh, J-Mac and... Um, who won bloody Dream Team again? Dylan. Uh, some bloke. Dylan, yeah. If, uh, if those two winners want to drop me a PM, you guys are both on... Uh, Oh, no, J- I don't, J-Mac, I don't know whether you're on Bigfooty. But anyway, drop me a, a DM on Twitter or uh, uh, on Bigfooty uh, with your address details so I can send those footies out to you. That would be awesome. And Grey Crow, if you can get in touch with me on Bigfooty and we'll work out how to get you some beer. Good job. Now, Macca, it's up to you, mate, to bring us home. Oh, yeah. oh yes, I am a scrubby old man. That's what I am, and I really don't care who knows it. I don't vote politicians and I don't. Well, first, we'll start off with the sweets. And the sweets this time, uh, we did touch lightly on them just a little while ago. Uh, as Pete said, the point in watching the game on the weekend was really just to see the young boys. And, um, and I know Dodo didn't play, but we did uh, have at least three good players emerge out of this year. And uh, there's Dodo, um, there's, uh, uh, what's his name? Um, Macca, Macca, this is a name? very subdued start. Very subdued. I'm actually... What do you think I, of Burton, Macca? I'm I had quick, a, I'm a, questioning a, don't find me segment. Up. No, I... No. I, I, I had a rule written down and I have lost my paper. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Did you check, check, the check the letterbox? Right, sorry. Yeah, back, yeah, back to what I say. Dodo and Gallucci uh, and uh, Miller has taken a big step forward. Um, <sighs> it's, not, uh, it's not often that we get three players that you can see have got very long futures with the club emerge in the one year and... Uh, uh, I, I, to me, the switch go to... Is the, Mrs. The Macca there? Double... She is. You want to talk it? Yeah, Not can to... you put her on, please? Because we need Mrs. Macca's sweets and smacks. She's the actual star of the show. Right. Well, Cause... Cause... This, this, is, this is an insipid This is an insipid effort by you, Macca. Oh, I, we know, need... I know. I lost, I lost my piece of paper. We, we need Mrs. Lot. Macca Macca's... to give us a bloody recipe or something. Macca's mailing it in, which is a big well, effort. You need, a piece of paper. you need a piece of paper to have the word dickhead written down. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're all hanging out for one thing, Macca. Jesus. <laughs> no, it wasn't, it wasn't the bloody... <laughs> no, I still got I... half a bottle of wine to go. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wanted... Sam McClure and uh, uh, Caroline Wilson were going to get the smack for... Dickheads. Carrying a lot. Well, they were dickheads. And they were... Yeah. You stole my line, they... Macca. And they were carrying like pork chops about this bloody camp again. <laughs> Couldn't agree and, with you more. <laughs> yeah, I've got to say, that I'm absolutely sick about the bloody camp. And uh, I blame Burton for everything, and it's Burton's fault. So there you are. But what, can you tell us some details on why it's Burton's fault? What, you want bloody details? <laughs> yeah, that? I mean, just, just to bring us up to speed. Well, firstly, he put the behind this bloody mob for the camp. Oh, Jesus, he, here we go. 
He, he put in a, he implemented a training program that broke down all the bloody players. He is an absolute dickhead, and he's yeah! <laughs> Bingo! <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, come on, a good piece of paper. <laughs> if Mecca can find his piece of paper, we will post it on Facebook uh, just as, and Twitter just as evidence that such piece of paper did actually exist. Uh, to be honest with you, I'm not so sure. Um, thanks, Mecca, for your sweets and smacks. Now, everyone on the chat is actually saying that was Mecca's final sweets and smacks, notwithstanding the fact that it could be just based on performance. Uh, True Center Night Live will be consider, uh, continuing throughout uh, the final series. Oh, I haven't actually told you blokes that yet, but... <laughs> 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 but this wasn't in my contract. <laughs> but well, Some of us will be here during like, uh, next week and during the final series all the way through. Uh, same as last year, we went through all the way through until um, the draft and uh, we'll be doing that again this year and it, it looks like we'll have a fair bit to talk about over the coming weeks. Uh, just with the ongoing crap going on at the club, notwithstanding anything else. So, uh, uh, well, it's, yeah, going to be very, it's going to be a very busy trade period, mate, isn't it? I mean, that's where it's really, there's going to be a plenty of action for us in the trade period and the draft, I think. Yeah. Right on, Mrs. Macker, what Mrs. Macker wants to say a few words. All right, Mrs. Macker, come on board. This, this is a world exclusive. It is a world exclusive. Oh, Mrs. Macker, fantastic. That's me. How you it go- is me. Uh, just first of all... Uh, uh, thank you for coming on to our esteemed show. I think the question that everyone's asking is, how the hell do you put up with Mr. Macca? Mr. Macca would be, no, I'm going to be very biased. I'm sorry. He's having an, an eye operation tomorrow, and I'm deeply concerned for him in seriousness. Oh, is that so right? That's, that's why I lost his bit of paper. That's why I lost his bit of paper, only one eye. Oh, no, well, we... Uh, now we feel bad. Oh, no, I, I don't. I mean, I do. I, do. I love that. <laughs> His dulcet tones put me to sleep. No, in in oh, all is- in all seriousness, we we love having Mister Macker on board, and uh, we do wish him all the very best for his operation tomorrow. But that notwithstanding, tell us more about this letterbox situation. I'd like to catch the bastard to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Did that sound familiar? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> You've just been added to the yeah. drinking game. <laughs> You're a dead ringer. Absolutely. Oh, well, match made in heaven. Match yeah. made in heaven. Yeah. Fantastic. It, it is. Oh, it's a beautiful letterbox. It was magic. Was I, it? I don't know. It was 300 bucks, but didn't matter mine. Now we've it, got a, what is it, $50 one. Well, that $300 one's looking all right on my front yard at the moment. Yeah. Catches the letters quite lived, nicely. <laughs> yeah. If I knew where you lived, I'd come and get it back. <laughs> and that's why you don't. All right. <laughs> Thanks, re- Mrs. Macca. Lovely talking to you. I really enjoyed talking to you, listening to you guys. Sunday and Tuesday. So thanks very much. Oh, for thanks so much. And right. Thanks for thanks, catch you. Back. thanks for that. Okay. No catch worries. You. Bye. Bye. And in all seriousness, uh, Mr. Macca. Uh, Yep. All, all the very best and good luck for tomorrow with your eye operation. Yeah, a bit worried about the bloody thing. So well, I have been a little bit distracted tonight. So. Is it just one or? Yeah, just one eye. It's, uh, I had one operation on it. Uh, the sight's okay, but I've one side and one operation on it before and it made it. Um, I get a lot of pain in the eye because of what that woman did. And, uh. Uh, and and uh, this guy's hopefully going to correct it. But, you know, if they stuff up, well, then you have troubles. Yeah. So I'm, a little bit, I'm just a little bit nervous about it, that's all. Yeah. Well, you know, all jokes aside, mate, uh, you you give us something that we didn't have before on the Crowcast, so uh, we do wish you all the very best. <laughs> What's that, bad language? I, yeah, I wasn't going to say sure. exactly what it was. I'd, let's, <laughs> make sure you, make just sure you turn up positive. next week, Macca. <laughs> make, sure make sure you turn up next week, mate. Okay, I'll be here. <laughs> uh, I hope. No, you'll be fine. All the best, mate. mate. All you'll the best. You'll be fine. Hey, look, uh, let's wind it up for tonight. It's been a great show. Uh, thanks to everyone on, on both chats for joining us uh, tonight. Um, a fair bit to talk about, and uh, you guys make it that much more enjoyable on Spreaker and Facebook. Uh, don't forget, if you're listening to us on iTunes, please drop us a review. Uh, that would be great. 
Um, we are going through some changes on our website at the moment, so check back intermittently at aflcrowcast.com where you'll see some upgrades and a different look and feel and some new sections and whatnot. Um, we're also starting our Patreon uh, account so you can get some information if you log on to patreon.com forward slash aflcrowcast.com. Uh, don't forget, of course, that uh, the offerings within each of the tiers on Patreon will be offered next season. So you're quite welcome to join up right now, but uh, the offerings will be for next season. Thanks, Macca. Thanks, Donkey. Thanks, Pete. It's been a pretty good night. And Thanks, uh, mate. Thanks, boys. No yeah, Sunday wrap on Sunday, of course, but we will be back next Tuesday for Tuesday Night Live. In the meantime, stay, stay safe. Good luck tomorrow, Macca, and we'll see you next Tuesday. Yeah, hopefully. See you all. <laughs> See you guys. All right.